whether the team is performing clean or unsightly. We'll cover it all here on Washington Football Nightly. I, of course, am your set man, Louis T. Thank you for joining me. Let's get to tonight's lead story. So the House of Representatives is deciding to dip their toe into the NFL realm. And I hate when this happens. I hate when politics cross-pollinates with sports. It usually never ends well. That said, as a Washington fan, it's like our last ditch effort to get Daniel Snyder the hell out of town. So people are getting excited. I'm not one of them because I've gone down this road before of getting excited about Daniel Snyder potentially being out as Washington football team owner and having it not come to fruition. So I just don't bother with these types of things anymore. Once the league decided to give this man an unprecedented loan to then buy the remaining shares of the organization from the minority owners so that he could then have 100% of ownership stake in the organization, I gave up all hope. They would not have done that if they thought it was a chance that they were going to run him out of the league. Now, some people say, well, they want him to have full ownership stake so that if he has to sell, it's easier to sell, number one. And number two, you can get more money. Number three, also, it would make it easy to transfer, much easier to transfer all of the team over to one owner. And that guy would then get to, or person would then get to name the team. Well, the, the name of the team is about to be changed here shortly. If they were going to run Daniel Snyder out of town, they would have done it in enough time so that they would not name the team something else and then have a new owner come in and have to accept whatever the team name is. There's so many different layers. We've talked about a lot of these things at the end of the day. I don't think he's going anywhere. So I really don't want to talk about this. But so many people have brought this to my doorstep. They want to hear from me about it. So I'm just going to tell you how I feel. I don't think anything's going to come of it. And I hate when the... Uh, when government, when Congress decides they want to step into the NFL or sports realm, like when the whole steroid, uh, you know, explosion happened in baseball and we had all these guys sitting there wagging their finger, talking definitively about how they weren't involved. And then we find out, you know, six months later they were involved. Like this stuff is stupid. It's frivolous and it's unnecessary. All right. There's so more pressing issues, so many things that matter so much more than what the hell's going on with some emails, okay? At the end of the day, the NFL has total control over this situation. The government can decide they want to snick their nose in if they want, but the NFL is really going to divulge whatever they feel like is in their best interest. If they know there's some damning emails regarding Daniel Snyder, they can just take those emails out and give them the rest. OK, like they're not going to allow something to happen that they don't want to happen is essentially what I'm trying to tell you. You think they're just going to say, hey, well, the government decided that they want in on this. The House of Representatives decides that they want in on this process and they want to oversee what's going on with these emails. And if there's more to this story, if this is, quote unquote, just the tip of the iceberg, you think the NFL is going to say, well, you got us. We're going to hand over all 650,000 emails because you requested. Yeah, we might hand over 647,723 because the other, you know, whatever, you know, 3,000 or 2,700 and whatever emails had something to do with Daniel Snyder. So we're going to take those out. They're not going to get anything. That's the, the end of this. They may find some things about some other guys that are still in the league or some other owners or whatever the case may be, probably won't find anything else on any other owners. But maybe there's some other personnel guys that are in the league that were involved in some of these emails that have had some things to say that are uh, a little unflattering and could easily be on the outs. Maybe there are some other guys that are still in the league right now as coaches and personnel people that should be a little bit nervous if some of these other emails get out. But at the end of the day, the one thing that we care about as Washington fans is Daniel Snyder. And if you're going to tell us it's just more Bruce Allen shit, who cares? He's not here anymore. All right. If it's not about Daniel Snyder, we don't give a shit. And I don't think anything will come of it. So at the end of the day, this is the first time I've covered it here on Washington Football Nightly. And this will be the last time unless some kind of concrete evidence. I'm talking about smoking gun. <sighs> And I want the case, the shell casing too, okay? I don't just want the weapon, I want the bullet as well. 
It would be nice to get an eyewitness account, too, with Daniel Snyder. He's been so damn slippery. I'd like to get gun, shell casing, and eyewitness account, but you're probably not going to get all of those things. So this is probably the last time we're going to address this here on the show because, again, I don't see anything coming of this situation. So uh, let's just move on to in other news. And this is a little bit more concrete. As a matter of fact, it's a lot more concrete because we are playing a game on Sunday. You know, just like last week when there was so much going on outside of the building and so much going on in terms of news surrounding the team that the actual football, the action on the field got drowned in all of the controversy off of it. This is not necessarily the same thing. Okay, it's not as busy. But it's still busy. But what's new? We're, we've grown accustomed to having, you know, a lot of sidebar conversations, you know, actually superseding the game action when your team stinks. If we were five and one, who would give a shit about what they're talking about? You know, in, in regards to Washington football team in these emails, because you'd be more concerned about, hey, we got a game against Green Bay for, you know, first place in the NFC conference. You know, it's depending on what happens with Arizona, but, you know, this could be a massive game. Two five and one teams. You wouldn't be talking about anything else, but we're two and four. And we're going to get our brains bashed in. At least that's the expectation. And so you're like, eh, let's talk about something that actually makes me excited. Daniel Snyder might have to sell the team. He's not. So practice was today again, right? So we have an update as to who practiced, who didn't, who will play, who might not play, and who's not going to play. And uh, let's look at that from both teams' perspectives, Washington and the Green Bay Packers. So um, we've talked about this already, and uh, we were spot on. Uh, earlier in the week, I told you that I thought it was going to be five guys. Then after yesterday's practice, seeing one of the five guys, Antonio Gibson, practice on a limited basis, uh, I said, well, they're going to be four guys then. He was one of my five. Then when I saw him practice yesterday, I said, oh, that's a great sign for us. Antonio Gibson's going to play. He spoke to the media today, and he said, I'm playing in this game, you know, so he's going to play. He was limited again today. He's listed as questionable. So is William Jackson, the third who did not practice today. And Shaka Tony had an illness more likely than not, unless Shaka Tony is gravely ill, you know, he'll play on Sunday more likely than not. He'll make the trip with the team to Green Bay. If he doesn't make the trip to the, with the team to Green Bay, then that will tell you that he's not playing, obviously. But I think he'll make the trip uh, if he feels better. And William Jackson III not practicing today. I think that's more of a precautionary measure. Look, it's Friday. You, you want this guy to be ready for Sunday. You don't need to push him. There's no reason for him to be out there. You, you know that this guy knows what's going on. Now, it's just a matter of execution. So you would like him to get the reps, but you also want him to play more so than you want him getting reps on a Friday. So I think he's going to play. Listening to Ron Rivera at his Friday presser, it sounded like they're prepared to move forward without William Jackson III. I still think he's going to be available, but I think they'll limit the amount of reps he takes, meaning you may see Kendall Fuller having to slide to the outside again, which I, I just I told you I more so want to see Kendall inside and, and just let him stay there because that's part of the growing pains of what we've seen from Kendall Fuller is the yo-yoing him from inside to outside. Just let him focus on being an a slot corner, a nickel, and everything else will take care of itself. But at, at the end of the day, I think William Jackson, the third place, I, I know Antonio Gibson's going to play. We know about the guys that are going to be out. Sam Cosme's out with the ankle still. Um, Curtis Samuel, never, ever trust a man with two first names. Out with the groin injury. I think it's smart. This is the second game in a row he's missed. I wouldn't be shocked if he's able to play next week against Denver. That's a big one. And I think Ron is kind of loading up all of his weaponry for next week because he knows. And, and again, he's, no, no coach is ever going to concede, you know, defeat. No, no one's ever going to say, yeah, pro pretty much no, we're going to lose this game. But next week, that's a winnable game. But in his mind, he's probably thinking, we're probably going to lose this game. I don't want to lose any, you know, really big time impact players trying to beat a Packers team that is just flat out better than us. How about we save our squad for a struggling Denver Broncos team that's you know, lost four in a row that won't have Von Miller more likely than not next week, that continues to find it hard to score points. Let's load up all our weaponry for that game. Sheriff and, you know, Sam Cosme. And again, not to say that all these guys are going to be ready, you know, but let's, let's give ourselves the best chance to be healthy for that game and hopefully going into the bye week with a little bit of momentum if you can find a way to win that game. But I digress. Bottom line is Brandon Sheriff is out. 
Um, Curtis Samuel is out. Sam Cosme is out, and Cam Sims is out. So uh, those are the four guys that we thought would be out. Uh, they continue to nurse their injuries. They will not play. Um, and all the rest of the guys are going to play. Terry's going to play. Uh, Ricky Seals-Jones is going to play. Jonathan Allen, De'Ami Brown. You know, all those guys are going to play. We expected those guys to play. We talked about that earlier in the week on Wednesday when the first injury report came out. I felt like all of those guys would be just fine. And so far, that is the case. Uh, let's get to the Green Bay Packers side of things. Uh, so two starting offensive linemen are out. That's the same thing we had against the Saints, okay? Um, I thought the rush w- against the Saints was the best we've seen all season long. So maybe we get some help. No Dennis Kelly, which means, and he's their starting left tackle, which means they may have to go in a different direction with a rookie or uh, left tackle. I've seen this rookie. Uh, he's got some skill, but he's not, you know, polished by any stretch of the imagination. He's extremely raw. Uh, that's a position we may be able to take advantage of. We'll see. Uh, Josh Myers is also out there, their center. He's a rookie, so they're going to have to do some shuffling around the offensive line. Uh, they've been here before. This, these guys have missed games already, so it's, this won't be new to them uh, in this particular game. But again, it's still something that we may be able to take advantage of, so that's a good thing. Um, I was shocked that Preston Smith was able to, to give us uh, or give um, the Packers something in practice today. That, that lets me know that more likely than not, He's going to play Darnell Savage. Once he practiced yesterday, I said, okay, he he must have sustained this concussion either last week or it was a very, very mild concussion, which I never like to talk about the severity of a concussion because you just don't know. But, you know, obviously he practiced twice this week. More likely than not, he's going to play. Kevin King was limited all week with a shoulder injury. He's going to play and they, they can't afford for him to not play being that they're already down Jair Alexander. They're, you know, all-world cornerback who's been out since early October and placed on IR. He's not playing in this game among other star players for this Packers defense. They can't afford any more hits to their secondary. So Kevin King is going to play more likely than not. And so Equinemius St. Brown, we already knew he was going to play. He's been a full participant all week long. So uh, again, I, I think that there are some really big hits there for the Packers. You know, that offensive line, taking a little bit of a beating there. And we'll see what happens with all of the guys that are questionable. I think all of them are going to play, but we'll see what kind of an impact they are able to have. So, um, you know, jumping back into in other news, when you look at the um, different guys that stepped up to the podium today, first of all, let's go in reverse order. Uh, Montez Sweat stepped up to the podium and generally Tez doesn't have a lot to say. You know, you get one or two word answers and, you know, the the media members are usually baffled at what to ask because they're trying to draw conversation out of him and Tez is just not going for it. Well, today, I thought it was very smart on their part and and how the questions were asked. And it started with the first reporter that did a really good job of asking Tez a question that was going to garner more than a two word response. And it was also a topic that he was interested in, in discussing. So he was asked about uh, high school football in Georgia, which is where Montez Sweat is from. And and does he think the quality of of football players coming out of the Georgia area is starting to improve? And did he feel like that helped his uh, process in terms of making him ready for the collegiate game? And he talked about, you know, the, 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 the process of high school ball in, in, in the, the South in general, he, he made a general uh, generalization about how the, the game is played and it's year round in the South where it's warm all year round. Whereas in the North, it's just more of a seasonal thing, more of a spring and, and you know, summer thing. No real, you know, or excuse me, more of a summer and fall thing. They don't do spring ball per se. So he's like, yeah, you know, we feel like we're a little bit more equipped to deal with, you know, college football where there's spring ball. Obviously, you're, you're practicing in the summer as well, and then you play your games in the fall into the winter, depending on how far you go. And then you just start it all over again with a quick, you know, little break in there and for the winter time, and then back at it again in the spring. So he's like, you know, we feel like we're more prepared than a lot of these players coming from the north where there is really no year-round football. So um, that got him talking. And then every other question that was fired at him after that, 
Tez was he was with it. I was like, whoa. I mean, this was a thoughtful Montez Sweat giving long-winded answers. Something I hadn't seen before. So uh, that was pretty cool. And, you know, I, I love hearing from guys like Montez Sweat because, you know, he's not a guy that's, you know, got a lot to say a lot of times. So when he does speak, it's usually pretty profound. You know, you know guys like that, the quiet type that really doesn't have a lot to say. And I don't think Montez Sweat is a quiet dude by any stretch of the imagination. I think he's a very, you know, loquacious guy, you know. But he doesn't talk to people that he doesn't know. That's not his thing, you know. But he knows his teammates. And I I bet he's a character and he talks a lot and and he's a a fun-loving guy. He jokes a lot. He strikes me as one of those types of players and people. But, you know, in terms of the media, we're not boys. We're not friends, you know. So I'm not going to be talking to you a whole ton. But he did say a lot today and he talked about this team sticking together. He talked about his offsides penalty, and I love how he owned that. He was like, yeah, that's just, that's on me. You know, generally, he said not to make any excuses. Normally, the officials will tell you, hey, you, lo- you lined up offsides, you might want to back up a little bit. But he said they weren't doing that in, in that game in particular, but he said, I got to look down the line. I got to see the ball. I got to back up, you know, know where the ball is, and that's just, that's on me. I got to be better about that. So he owned up to that mistake because it was a costly one in the game on Sunday versus the Chiefs. He talked about this defense Um, kind of banding together and and this team overall banding together and, uh, you know, relying and uh, and kind of leaning on their leaders in the locker room on the defensive side of the football, in particular Jonathan Allen and Chase Young, and, and, you know, looking to those guys to continue to help them get through this defensive struggle that they're going through right now. And he said, you know, you know, the rush and the cornerbacks or the back end are, you know, married and tied together. We hear that all the time. If the rush is good, the back end is going to be great and benefit from it. If the back end is good, the rush is going to benefit from it. It's a mutually beneficial relationship those two are. And so he talked about how one needs to take care of the other and the other needs to take care of the other. And so, you know, defense has been a little bit better over the last two weeks. And he said, look, we just got to worry about being more consistent for you know, four quarters. We, we felt like we played a good half of football against the Chiefs, but we didn't play four quarters, and that's what we need to kind of strive for. So uh, I thought there was some good dialogue between Tez and the media. Um, the guy that I was really the most anxious to hear from was secondary coach, you know, Chris Harris, because one, that unit is performing probably um, at the least efficient um, manner or clip right now, and also, he's a guy that is very thoughtful, and I told you I think he's going to be a defensive coordinator here shortly, uh, and, and, and I think that's just a stepping stone to him becoming a head coach in this league. So uh, I said, you know, enjoy Chris Harris while you can because I think he's going to ultimately be a head coach. Similar to Dan Campbell, he's a guy that just brings a ton of energy. So with that said, he talked about the secondary and their struggles, and he said, look, you know, th- th- and I've said this to you guys before, this this." defense struggled last year like a lot of people talk about it's the second year of this defense and he said look it's the second year for me being in this defense but he said we got five new members of the secondary and i i've I've pointed these things out like yeah we talk about oh it's the second year del rio these guys should be xyz along in the process and i'm like yeah but you're, you're assuming that everyone's on the same page there are five new guys in that secondary. I'm like, there's a uh, plenty of new pieces. Jamin Davis is a brand new piece to this defense. Bobby McCain is a brand new piece to this defense. William Jackson the third, brand new piece to this defense. Juice, brand new piece to this defense. They're, they're, Atlanta Collins essentially is a brand new piece to the defense coming back from injury at, almost after missing the entire year last year. This defense is new all over the place. And so, you know, while you want to talk about there should be continuity and guys should be more comfortable second year in Del Rio's system. You're like, it's a lot of new bodies out here. It's a lot of new guys. So he pretty much said, like, look, it's a, still a learning curve for a lot of these guys. And he said, you know, last year took us a little while to figure it out, get guys on track. But once we did, we hit our stride and we started playing really good, competent football. We think we're heading towards that same thing this year. I hope he's right. That's what I'm banking on. He also talked about the struggles of William Jackson III, which I was dying to hear his take on him because, you know, a lot of people have been really disappointed in what we've gotten from him to this point. I'd be lying to you if I said I wasn't somewhat disappointed in what we've gotten from him to this point. And he said, you know, at the end of the day, 
It, we're asking him to do some things that he's just not comfortable doing yet, and, and it's going to take some time. But he said the things we're asking him to do is going to be beneficial for him in the long run. But it, it, it is an adjustment. And, you know, I just harken back to when Ron first got here last year and the D-line, you, you know, you, you pretty much ripped up everything that Jim Tom taught them for the first, you know, two, three, four years for some of these guys of their careers and said, hey, no, 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 we don't want you doing it that way anymore. We want you doing it this way. And there was pushback. Like, they're like, look, no, we, we've been doing it this way, and we think this way works. And, you know, Ron pretty much said, well, you were, you know, 3-13 and 13 last year. You really think that shit works? You know? Uh, I think you should do it the way that we're trying to teach you to do it. And so I think there's a little bit of that going on with William Jackson III because he had success. That's how he got the contract here in Washington. Having success, doing it the way he had been doing it, and they're teaching him different principles and ways to use his length and athleticism, and it's just a bit of a transition for him so he said he thinks he's going to be fine in the long haul and you know he wants to continue continue to see the growth with him and uh they think that it's ultimately going to be beneficial for this defense once he figures it out so um it was good to hear from chris harris listening to guys like him again and i've talked about this already it, it's it's all lip service until some action is actually behind it you know we're looking for actionable steps to be taken you know things that you can put in place and then have action follow it we haven't had that yet it's just a lot of talking but you know when guys like chris harris talk i tend to listen so it was good to hear from him and his optimism has me excited about this defense and its growth he talked about cam curl last thing and then we'll move on he said you know cam curl is a guy that is just such a savvy heady football player for his age he's a young guy and i remember del rio talking about just how smart cam curl was as a rookie and, and even ron to a lesser degree talking about how smart cam curl was uh, as a football player which allowed them to put him on the field and put so much on his plate as a rookie last season and you know he's a jack of all trades we've seen him as a buffalo nickel we've seen him over the slot as a nickel we've seen him um, you know, as a box safety, we've seen him as a deep safety. He's been all over the field for this defense. And it's because of his ability to handle so much mentally that allows them to move him around the football field. And he said, yeah, Cam Curl's just a special type of player. And he just gets it from a mental standpoint. And, you know, listening to Cam Curl talk, you get the sense that he's a smart guy and that he gets it. And I think you've seen that translate over to the field, which is why they've, they're moving Landon Collins, you know, closer to the line of scrimmage so that they can, you know, maximize Cam Curl and get him on the field. As we saw, he played every defensive snap for this team in week six versus the Kansas City Chiefs. So uh, with that said, let's transition to behind enemy lines, get our keys to the game for victory against the Green Bay Packers in week number seven and what it'll take for Washington to keep this game close and give themselves a chance. Washington's offense versus Green Bay's defense. So the first key to the game is attack, attack, attack. If you're Washington, they have no Jair Alexander, no Zadarius Smith. Those are their two best defensive players. Both of them are out of this contest. Preston Smith is dealing with an oblique injury. I think he's going to play, but just how effective is he going to be with that oblique injury? Um, it, it remains to be seen. I'd like to think that he's going to be somewhat compromised. This is a Packers defense that just added Jalen Smith. They just added another defender in their secondary. They're a very young, raw, and banged up secondary. I think you have to attack them at, at all phases um, and at all levels, and if you're Taylor Heineke, that means if you must run, run. Don't just stand there, run. If the opportunity presents itself, run, okay? If the, the opportunity to get rid of the football is there, get rid of the football. If, if the quick check down is there, you get your Kirk Cousins on and check it down quickly so that a, a four-yard gain could turn into an eight-yard gain because you got to the check down quickly. It, it's little things like that, little subtleties that Taylor Haneke isn't doing, and he's got to find the open receiver. Speaking of which, um, explosive plays is the next key. So attack, attack, attack. I, I don't care how you do it. You know, a lot of you want to run the football more, and we've had some success running the ball. We just haven't run it enough. 
That's fine. I don't care how you do it. We just have to attack that defense that is missing some of their best defensive players. We must be on the attack. We can't have a ton of three and outs and, and not sustaining drives and putting this defense on the field over and over again against this Green Bay Packers offense that can be explosive with Aaron Rodgers. We have to attack the Green Bay Packers, put them on their heels, and make them have to make plays instead of us allowing teams to just be able to passive aggressively get off the field because we're making mistakes and self-destructing. So uh, we got to attack the Green Bay Packers from the outset until the very end. Attack, attack, attack. They got guys out. We have to take advantage of that and attack the young players. They got a young rookie corner and Eric Stokes out there. They got Kevin King who's banged up. We know he's banged up and can be vulnerable out on the field. We have to take advantage of that. We have to take advantage of the fact that they're two best pass rushers. One isn't playing and the other one is compromised. Attack. Next key is explosive plays. The last couple of weeks, you know, we had explosive plays against the Giants. We had explosive plays against the Falcons, you know, but we haven't had any explosive plays really since that Falcons game. The Ricky Seals-Jones touchdown uh, against the um, Chiefs last week was an explosive play, but They've been too few and far between, honestly speaking. And it's been feeling more like last year's offense. And I remember telling you guys, I made a comment in the the mob squad during the game on Sunday that the defense felt like last year's defense because of the performance we were getting in the first, you know, two and a half quarters. And the offense also felt like last year's offense, which is not a good thing because it felt like this methodical, sluggish offense that had to rely on, you know, heavy third down conversions and not being able to get any explosive plays to get the football down the field. And we're just not good enough. We're not a disciplined enough offense to avoid mistakes, a holding penalty, an illegal shift penalty, a batted ball because Taylor Heineke's like 5'8", a kid. Um, but we we haven't been clean enough on offense to go on a 15-play drive without something bad happening that derails the drive and forces us to have to either settle for a field goal or ultimately have to punt it away. So we need explosive plays to, to cut that whole risk factor down, you know, and uh, I don't care how you get it. I don't care if Taylor Heineke chucks it deep and he's got to do a better job of giving his guys an opportunity to either catch it or draw a pass interference penalty. I would much rather him underthrow the football with a defender that's not looking than to overthrow it where there's no chance of a pass interference penalty. And a lot of times when he overthrow, I mean, throws a deep ball, he's usually overshooting it. I thought, Last week, he gave his guys a chance. Terry could have either caught that ball or forced the pass interference. He didn't either. I thought De'Ami Brown could have caught that ball in the end zone, and he didn't catch it. Uh, so I thought he actually gave his guys a chance down the field last week. I need to see that again and either draw a pass interference, make the play. I don't care if it's a catch and run on a slant or a, a wide receiver screen or a running back screen or a tight end screen or it's a run play. I don't really care how the big plays and explosive plays are achieved. We just need some in this game we can't afford to continuously have to put together these long marathon drives because frankly we're not disciplined enough and we don't execute consistently enough to go on those drives without having something go awry and having to settle for either a field goal or having a a long drive stall out around midfield and have to punt can't settle for field goals speaking of settling for field goals the next key is can't settle for field goals much like last week this isn't a field goal game And as much as I would love to try out our brand new toy, anytime you get a brand new toy, you want to try it out and see how it works. Chris Blewett is a guy that I'm I'm anxious. I would love to send him on the field for a 54-yarder and see how he handles that. But guess what? I don't want to kick any 54-yard field goals. I'd like to score touchdowns in this game. You know, but if the opportunity presents itself, we have one of those drives that doesn't quite make it to the red zone and it stalls out at the, you know, 34-yard line. I want to be able to see if he can kick a 52-yard field goal at Lambeau where the kicking conditions aren't always the greatest. I'd love to see if he can find a way to cut through that wind and get that thing through the uprights. But at the end of the day, I'd much rather see Chris Blewett on, on 33-yard extra points. That, that really, I'd love to see him go 4-4 from 33 yards out on four extra points instead of him kicking three field goals in this game and us only scoring you know 19 points or us only scoring 23 points. I'd like to see him kicking extra points that's going to be achieved if we find pay dirt consistently and so I think we've got to have red zone efficiency you know we've been really lackluster the last two weeks in the red zone it's really what killed us against the Saints 
And last week, we didn't even have a red zone trip. Our one touchdown came outside of the red zone. We were awful on offense last week. We didn't even make it into the red zone. So we've got to be efficient when we are moving the football, but we also have to have opportunities in the red zone in order to score because, again, we're not that explosive of an offense, not without Curtis Samuel. Never, ever trust a man with two first names. So I think we need to be efficient when we get into the red zone. That's going to be key because, again, you're playing against Aaron Rodgers, Devontae Adams, you know Aaron Jones, and company. They're liable to score 34-plus. If you can't score 34-plus, you're not going to have a chance to win. Play mistake-free football slash keep the crowd quiet is the next key to the game offensively. Look, we know the Packers are a very good team at home. You know, they're one of the better teams uh, protecting their home building. And part of the reason why is because the crowd gets so involved. There's nothing else to do in Green Bay, Wisconsin, other than go to Green Bay Packers games. And there aren't going to be a ton of Washington fans infiltrating that stadium. They're one of those stadiums that are kind of sacred and that they, they sell out every week. I told you guys, I think a couple of weeks ago, about the waiting list for Green Bay Packers tickets. It's, it's like how Washington's waiting list used to be for season tickets. You, you were probably going to die before you actually came up for your turn to get season tickets. Like, if you're a Packers fan and you just put your name on the list for season tickets 10 years ago... Uh, your kid's kid might get those tickets if they transfer over. You won't see the light of day. And the reason that is is because Packers fans are rabid about their Packers. That crowd is going to be delirious. And the only way to keep them quiet is to go out there and execute and play mistake-free football. If you turn it over, they're going to go nuts. And that's going to just get that snowball going downhill and it's going to turn into a, a boulder of a snowball that you can't stop that's ultimately going to crush you and end up in your demise. If you go out, you don't turn it over, you sustain drives, you score touchdowns, you could quiet that crowd very quickly. But if you make mistakes, you get off to a slow start, the Packers start off the game like everyone else seems to do against us on a seven-play, 75-yard drive that ends in a Packers touchdown, and then we go three and out, they're going to be riled up. We've got to play mistake-free football. And that's not just don't turn the ball over. You can't have drops. Terry had a big drop uh, last week. The week before that, De'Ami Brown had a big drop on the third down. We can't have drops, right? We can't have unforced errors, meaning we can't line up offsides on third and 10. Aaron Rodgers is going to come out and he's going to snap. He's going to hard, you know, count us and whatnot. I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Like you can't have mistakes. Can't be holding on first and, and, and 10 or even second and three to make it second and 13. We, we are not good enough to overcome first and 20. It doesn't seem like it. Scott Turner's play calling is awful in those situations because he wants to run it on first and 20. We'll get two. Now it's second and 18. Now he wants to throw a screen. He should have thrown that screen on first down. Or now he wants to throw a, a, a you know shallow cross and he gets six. And now it's third and 12. We're awful in those situations. Can't put yourself way behind the sticks and expect to beat the Green Bay Packers. Have to play mistake-free football. And that includes making your field goals. If we don't finish a drive with a touchdown, got to make your kicks. Extra points and all. And then finally, Terry, JD, plus one is the final key to the game. Terry, JD, plus one. So what that essentially means is we need heavy contributions from Terry McLaurin, JD McKissick, and one more guy on offense. I don't care who that other guy is, if it's Antonio Gibson, if it's Ricky Seals Jones, if it's, I think it's Adam Humphreys, to be honest with you. I think that other guy is Adam Humphreys. I think he's open quite a bit, and he's just not getting enough attempts. I think Adam Humphreys could be a guy that could be averaging up over 80 yards a game receiving if he just got the football, more opportunities. Taylor Heineke is fixated on getting the ball to Ricky Seals Jones. He's fixated on trying to get Terry's, uh, Terry opportunities, and I don't blame him for that. And he's fixated on trying to get the ball to De'Ami Brown, which is fine, but you got Adam Humphreys wide-ass open, and you're forcing it to guys that aren't open. That doesn't make any sense. Get the ball to the open receiver, and that guy usually is hump. So 
Uh, I don't really care who it is. It could be Deami Brown for all I care. It just we need one more guy to step up. We know what Terry is, and I think Terry's going to have a really big day because there is no star corner to you know shadow him or shut him down. And the Packers, I think, are vulnerable defensively. I think Terry has one of those seven catch, you know, 122 yard games um, against the Packers. I think J.D. McKissick, again, J.D. had a big role last week. He was our leading rusher and receiver, over 100 all-purpose yards. This, If the trend continues, J.D. McKissick will be invisible this week. He'll have three total touches, and they'll, he'll be non-existent, and they'll forget he was even on the roster. But if I'm Scott Turner, J.D. McKissick has to be a big part of the offense moving forward. We're a much more explosive, dynamic offense when J.D. McKissick is a part of the game plan and getting his fair share of touches. And then a third guy has to step up. And again, I don't care where that third guy comes from. We just need another guy to be someone the Packers have to key in. I don't care if that's DeAndre Carter. Somebody else has got to step up. But those two have to be focal points of this offense in order for us to have any kind of success. Um, going over to the defensive side of the football, Washington's D versus Green Bay's offense. Be selectively aggressive is the first um key to the game and Ron Rivera talked about wanting Jack Del Rio to blitz a little bit more you know Jack isn't interested in discussing you know game plan matters and he's all you you can talk to coach about that if coach has already disclosed some of that to you guys that's fine I'm not interested in having those types of discussions I've always told you you know Jack's probably not happy with all of the information that Ron divulges to the media sometimes Ron can be a little bit too forthcoming with you know how he feels but Ron told us from the get-go when he got here uh, he's pretty much transparent and tells it like it is and doesn't have any problems, you know, you know, being forthcoming. He said, you know, sometimes it's to his detriment. But, you know, at the end of the day, he wants Del Rio to blitz more. I think we all want Jack Del Rio to blitz more. And the crazy part is when he's made a concerted effort to blitz, we've hit home. He just doesn't do it enough. I think you have to pick your spots against Aaron Rodgers. This, he's not one of these quarterbacks you can just say, And let's just throw the kitchen sink at him. He's not dumb. He sees your blitz. He's going to call out, bark out a hard count to get you to show where you're coming from. And then he's going to exploit it. We have to be selective when we decide to send blitzes. I've seen teams do it creatively where they fake a blitz one way. Aaron Rodgers thinks he's getting that. They drop out on that side and they come from the other side. And now he's got a play set up where he's trying to hit them behind where the blitz is. He thinks it's coming from. It's not. They disguised it beautifully, come from the other side, and now he's sat. Like, you got to do things like that, and you got to pick your spots. Again, I don't know if we're a smart enough defense to do those types of things, but I think we do need to be a little bit selective. And when we send pressure, we got to be more aggressive, though, getting after the quarterback if we can't generate pressure with just four. Next key to the game, tackle, tackle, tackle. We've been really, really bad as a tackling team this season. I mean, last week might have been the worst tackling. Um, No, I I think the Falcons game might have been even worse than last week. But, I mean, the fact that we've got multiple games that we can kind of, you know, fall back on as really poor displays of tackling by this team says that we're not good enough in that department. And a, a team like Green Bay, they take full advantage of not making tackles. So we're going to have to be better in that department. We got to tackle better. That's a fundamental thing that we don't seem to do well. And when I watch other teams around the league, and a lot of you have said the same thing, it's like night and day watching other teams that are actually solid defensive clubs and then watching us. It's not the same. We need to tackle better. Period. End of discussion. Next key to the game for the Washington D, slow down the Adams and Jones show. So, look, I've said this before with other teams and other players there are certain guys that you just have to game plan to stop. And with the Green Bay Packers, it's no different. You know the two guys. You know the names. You know what you got to do. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to do it. Many have tried. Many have failed. We're going to take our hand at trying to slow down Devontae Adams and Aaron Jones. The Packers' offensive lifeline extends from Aaron Rodgers to Devontae Adams to Aaron Jones. Those are the three guys. Well, Aaron's going to touch it on every single snap. So you're not going to stop Aaron or uh, Aaron Rodgers, okay? But you can slow down Aaron Jones. You can slow down Devontae Adams. And I heard one of the Packers play-by-play guys, uh, Antonio Freeman, or not play-by-play, one of their analysts, 
former Green Bay Packers wide receiver Antonio Freeman say, if I were Washington this week, I would take the chance and roll the dice and double team Devontae Adams. I'm not going to let 17 beat me. And I would do the same thing because I don't believe in their other receivers. I don't think that, you know, they're going to have this explosive day from Randall Cobb, even though he's fully capable. I don't think Alan Lazard is going to kill us. Marquez Valdez Scantling might get us because he's got speed and we struggle to keep plays in front of us. But I'll take my chances with those other guys beating us. You know, Amari Rogers. I'll take my chances with the rookie getting off in the game. What I don't want to see is Devontae Adams doing what Keenan Allen did to us. And that's the last time we've seen the route runner like that was Keenan Allen. And he went off for like 11 catches for 120 yards and some big time plays I, in some huge third down conversions. I don't want to see that shit happen again. He's that type of player, but just better. So um, hopefully they got a game plan for Devontae Adams, because if they don't, it's going to be a long afternoon. And to second that and further that point, Aaron Jones is just, just as dangerous as a runner and a wide receiver. And if we can't cover him as a receiver, he's going to do us in because he's so multifaceted. So you got to slow down the Jones and um, pa- uh, Adams show. You can't do that. You're not going to have a chance against this Packers offense. Next key to the game for the Washington defense, stay disciplined and stay deep. So stay disciplined. You know, one of the things you got to go into the game anticipating is that Aaron Rodgers is going to hard count you. Try to get you to jump off sides and get a free play. Or if you, you know, jump off sides, go after him aggressively, force the officials to blow the whistle so there isn't a free play component there. But you don't want to give up the free five yards either. Be disciplined on defense. And that that doesn't just go for pre-snap things with not jumping off sides. But that also means staying deep If you're the deep third middle safety, stay deep. If you're playing cover two, don't have your eyes in the wrong place and and chase down a dig in front of you knowing that you have deep half responsibility. Be where you're supposed to be. You know, take care of your deep half. So got to stay disciplined in coverage. In your rush lanes, Rodgers can get out of there. Um, And you got to stay deep. Nothing cheap, nothing deep. Keep everything in front of you so that the Packers have to earn it. I think this is a good Packers offense. I don't think it's an elite Packers offense. I do think it can be slowed down to to where we have a chance, but that only happens if you limit the explosive plays that the Packers have in this game. And then finally, keep A-Rod in the pocket and at least one turnover. So last week we didn't do a good enough job of keeping Patrick Mahomes in the pocket. He got outside of the pocket. He broke contain too many times. He used his legs a few times in some critical third down situations. And when he didn't use his legs, he used his legs to extend to then throw it and make a play off schedule. We can't allow that to happen. We know Rodgers is one of the best in the league at making those types of off schedule plays. So we've got to make sure that we bottle him up. Aaron Rodgers is a lot older now than he was five years ago. Five years ago, he was just as big a threat to run it as he was to throw it. Now, he doesn't really want to run. He only runs as the absolute last resort. He, he's, a lot of times with pressure, he's looking for somewhere to fall down. He doesn't want to take any hits. He knows his importance to the Green Bay Packers, and his importance extends to his health. And if he's not healthy, he can't help this team. So he's not looking to take shots. Once upon a time, Aaron Rodgers would never give up on a play. Now he's like, you got me. I'll come back and fight another day. Next play. So he'll throw it away. He'll get down on the ground. We've got to harass him and make him uncomfortable where he tries to get out of the pocket and escape. He needs to see another jersey and decide, you know what? This seems like a really comfy spot right here. I'm going to lay down and take my chances on next down. Keep him in the cup, as they say. Keep him in the pocket. And it'd be great to get at least one turnover. One thing Aaron Rodgers doesn't do very often is turn it over. Whether it's fumble or interception, he doesn't make a ton of mistakes. He is one of the think the most adept quarterbacks at saying, you know what, I got nothing here, I'm going to throw it away. He doesn't make a lot of mistakes. Most years you look up Aaron Rodgers, four interceptions. Aaron Rodgers, six picks. Aaron Rodgers, you know, seven at the most. Like he's not a guy that is even remotely close to double-digit picks on most seasons. And it's because he just takes care of the football. So I'm not looking for Aaron Rodgers to necessarily throw us one. But 
not that being said, I don't care where we get the turnover from. I just think we need at least one. It'd be nice. And we've been forced to turnovers lately. Let's hope that that continues. Five in the last two weeks, uh, in, in each of the last two respective first halves, we've generated turnovers, multiple turnovers, two against the Saints, three against the Chiefs. I think that needs to be a trend that we try to continue, although it'll be a lot tougher against Aaron Rodgers, who is very stingy with the football. So those are my keys to the game. Now let's get to my final outcome and get out of here. Look, you know what this is. It's a stick up. My hands are up. You got us. I know what this is. As much as I want this to be a competitive game, I don't think it will be. Much like last week, I didn't think it would be competitive, and it was for two and a half quarters, and then the Chiefs ran away and hid. I think this game is somewhat similar. We hang tough early. Um, you know, you get this false optimism, you know, and then right before half, they break our backs. You know, this is a, you know, 10-3 to 3 game or something along those lines. We're struggling offensively again, and then they score a touchdown right before the half. They make it 17-3, to 3, and then they kind of just take off from there and um, don't look back. I, and, and honestly, I don't think the score, the final score is indicative of just how one-sided this game, you know, was in, in, from the standpoint of Washington not being able to get the job done. Uh, I think they score a late touchdown to make the game interesting um, in terms of the score. But they're down 34 to 16, you know, with four minutes left in this game. And that that's essentially where they were. And then they score a garbage time touchdown to make it you know, 34 to 23. They may even go for two to try to cut it to 10. Doesn't matter. That's essentially how I see this thing playing out is that we weren't close. The score may indicate that we only lost by 11, but we were down, you know, damn near 20 points, you know, for much of the fourth quarter. And um, we scored a touchdown in garbage time to make it look semi-respectable. I just think Aaron Rodgers and that offense is going to be too much for us. And I still don't have a ton of confidence in this offense with all of the missing parts, primarily Curtis Samuel. Oh, we'll see. We'll see. I could be wrong. I told you, I don't think these Packers are juggernauts. I don't. It's so unfortunate that we're not in a position to take advantage of them because I think they're very, very, um, with all the injuries, much like the Saints, they're very vulnerable. You know, this is a lackluster team, I feel like, and I think they're very beatable. I just don't think we're the team capable of beating them. You know, and that's frustrating because you don't get opportunities like this every day to get a Packers team that is wounded and that is very vulnerable. But I don't think we're in a position to really take advantage of it right now. And that's sad. But that's my scoring more. What is yours? What do you think the outcome of this game is going to be? Leave it down in the comment section. I'd love to hear from you guys as to how you think this game is going to turn out. Looking forward to watching this game uh, with the MOBB and seeing how things turn out. And then you know where to find me at the conclusion of the football game. But with that said, I'm going to glide to the side and get out of here, allow you guys to get your weekend kicked off and enjoy the festivities, whether it's baseball or it's basketball. The NBA is back in full effect. Um, you got a lot of uh, college football and things of that nature to consume over the weekend. So enjoy yourselves thoroughly. We'll, we'll meet on Sunday, congregate and talk about what happened in the game, and what to do moving forward. But that's going to do it for me, your man, Louis T. I am a Washington fan, etched in burgundy and gold. My Washington spirit will never die. Washington spirit will never fold until we meet again. Hail to our beloved Washington football team. I look forward to chopping it up with you guys on Sunday at the conclusion of Washington and Green Bay. Fellas, you know what time it is. Go and get the dub. I don't see it happening, but... You know what? Stranger things have happened. Um. Here comes the diesel. Here comes the diesel. There's the snap. Hand to Riggins. Good hole. He's got the first down to the 40. He's gone. The 35.